Welcome to the Pro-Life Action League series, Converted from Abortion Provider to Pro-Life Activist. In the following talk, former abortionist John Burchalski describes the spiritual journey that led him to quit performing abortions and dedicate his medical practice to the sanctity of life. It is a um, delight to be here with you um, on this beginning of this anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. I feel like a child again. Um, Joe Scheidler was a complicated man um, when I was on the other side of the fence. And I've never met him personally until this weekend. And I've also met his better half, being a gynecologist. Uh, I met Ann. And uh, to see these two um, heroes of mine, um, I am only here today speaking to you all because um, I stand on his shoulders. Intercessory prayer and intercessory suffering and sacrifice are key to conversion. It's what you heard from Abby, it's what you heard from Ruth and our friends. And it's also done in deeds and speaking out. So I just wanted to thank them again for this invitation because it's, we stand on their shoulders. And please give them a round of applause. Um, this conference is more than just information. It's about looking at a problem in a new way, built on everything we've done in the past, but to find a way to penetrate, as people have been saying, the hearts and minds of people in the industry. And uh, once again, I'm 52 years of age. Um, I've been married to Carolyn for over 20 years, or uh, at 20 years. I've got two young boys. I live in Northern Virginia with my dad, uh, who's still with us, and several animals. And um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm here to say that I want to put a, a face on people in the abortion industry, especially from the doctor's perspective. Um, and so I just wanted to start this with a, um, with a letter from one, of my, from one of our patients. This is a letter from a dad to his son on the news of their third grandchild. Thanks for your call and the very depressing news of another mistake in your mistake-filled life. I cannot sufficiently express my disappointment in and anger at your continuing lack of good judgment in your personal life. You do not seem to grasp the importance of long-term versus short-term decisions. The decisions you make will affect you, your family, and your personal success and financial stability the rest of your life. Nothing as easy as having a child. So many uneducated and incapable people do it. What is difficult to decide not to have children when your ability to support them in an, in an adequate manner is questionable. Children are expensive, and they are not toys. You have difficulty in supporting a wife and two children. What will you do with these? You should be concentrating on developing your professional capabilities, which obviously are not serving you well. Yes, I do encourage you to have an abortion. Your mother had one, and I fully supported her in that decision. Tis better to make a wise decision now rather than to regret a missed opportunity the rest of your life. I would be willing to pay for such a procedure provided that you agree to have a vasectomy in your wife a tubal ligation. You can't go on in this impossible manner. Moreover, you need to put your wife to work to generate the income that you obviously are not generating yourself. Moreover, you need to manage your money more effectively Spend only what is necessary. For some reason, you don't seem to understand the importance of this matter. For three years before Sarah, your wife, could have been working, and you could have put at least 20000 in the bank from her efforts. But you chose not to do that and are, not, and are now suffering the results of your bad judgment. It appears that neither you nor your wife has the ability to make intelligent decisions. You don't know how bad it makes me feel to write this letter to you, but I cannot continue to observe you to destroy your life and that of your family by stupid, immature actions like having another child. As I've said in the past, I'm willing to help you, but you need to make the commitment to act as an adult and dedicate yourself to being a successful rather than an adequate person. 
Or do you just choose to live in ignorance and poverty the rest of your life? I want to hear from you with regard to the corrective actions you are going to take, but time and my patience are very short. Love, dead. <laughs> now, I only say this because it's these complicated issues. Every one of us in this industry are broken. I am a wounded healer. So many of us in this room are in the pro-life movement because we have been wounded by our family, by our children, our parents. All of us, most of us, many of us. These issues are just not black and white. For me, it's not really a political football, no matter how much people debate health care. For us, health is based on relationships found in community. We're going to talk about that. Medicine is an act of mercy. We're going to talk about that. You hate the disease, but you love the patient. We're going to talk about that. And together, by working together in unity, knocking down the bridges and the, or building bridges between people on our side of the fence, we can love enough together in community to make abortion unwantable. Children and families and other human beings welcomed. Families stronger and society healthier. Health is based on relationships found in community. You know, it's fascinating. I'm, I had this talk prepared. Uh-uh, you got to go off script here. Because what's happening is there's a movement of the Holy Spirit here. This, we don't need any more lectures. We need to help each other, pray for one another, sacrifice for one another, intercessory. Because I'm convinced, just like Joe and Ann have been doing this, you know, it's funny, I was sitting across from Tony last night, and he tells me he's, he's been here 25 years ago. In our neck of the woods, there's still 8,500 abortions done in the state of Virginia every year. There's 2,500 done in my backyard of northern Virginia. All this sacrifice, all this persistence, all this perseverance is not for naught, Joe, and not for naught at all. I can come here today and be with heroes and heroines, newer ones like Abby and the ones that I've met, these other women who have come up here, these other men who have come up, who are going to come up here today, people who I've talked to in the audience, Father Frank. We're beginning to think about the heart as well as the head. It's not an intellectual argument, folks. It helps. It's not just politics. And once again, I'm doing this out of my experience. I'm a poor Polish kid. I grew up in a great, great family. We prayed every morning for the conversion of Russia. And in my lifetime, I've seen changes. That's the power of prayer. That's the power of leadership. That's the power of speaking truth to power, even when the other side has more money. And so what I want to try to talk about is putting a face that the abortionist, because I'm a doc, and we're the missing piece. In our center, at the Tepiak Family Center, we're trying to bridge the gap between the left and the right. We're a nonprofit company. We do social justice. We see the underserved. We partner with pregnancy centers. But we're also about the dignity of the human person and the image and likeness of daddy, right? It's both and. It's not either or. You don't pit one side against the other. We're not interested in doing one type of NFP. We have all the methods there because we've got to bridge these gaps, these walls that have been built up. We want to bridge the gap between the different churches, the outreaches between our Catholic and non-Catholic and Christian brothers and sisters. We're actually outreaching to people who believe in crystals. We're trying to find those, as someone said, those common values. But we have to come to the table knowing what we believe in, or else everything becomes dilute. And all of a sudden, Christ-centered health care becomes a minimum equation. Uh-uh. 
Christ never does anything minimum. It's always, he's a jealous God. He wants abundance. John 10.10, 10, I've come and I want it abundantly. And so what happens is, is that I'm here to try to build relationships with you all. Because I know out here, you're going to help us help, because now other doctors are coming to see what we do. They're burned out. They're cynical. They're pessimistic. Abortionists are now asking questions. Residents, medical students. So what I'm going to talk about for the next 20 minutes, 15 minutes, is going to be about what I learned speaking at 42 medical schools recently. You know, there's this whole idea of why, if abortion is so good, if it's such a part of excellent, complete reproductive health care, why do so few doctors do it? Do you know the National Abortion Federation, 30 to 40 percent, as best as we can tell that they report, are non-OBGYNs? Did you listen to one of our sisters here speaking earlier? She was going to be taught to do vaginal ultrasounds. It's like a video game. You don't need, we're going to create the standard of care, and then we're going to tell the community to follow us. Remember, this Affordable Care Act has now put abortion into mainstream medicine. And it's a done deal up till now. That's why this, once again, the politics is very important. We must vote. But it's more than that, because even if you change the legal, you're not going to change people's hearts. You're going to decrease the abuse, because when something's legal and a thought pops into your head, I can have and your stress goes away, it's easy to now. When it's harder, there's less abuse, but you're still not going after the heart. I want love, not sacrifice. Right? And so we have to learn to love enough. I have to learn to love enough in medicine as a doc. So, of course, where do I go to find this? It's not in the Word of God. It's in the Washington Post magazine section. It was called A Hard Choice, Choice, written by Patricia Mysall in November 23, 2008. She wrote this great piece, uh, followed a third-year medical student, of what it was like to perform an abortion, how it was such a hard choice. Because remember, I grew up in a great Christian Catholic family, said the rosary, went to high school, went to college, became a situational ethicist, relativistic, threw it all out, no objective truth, forget the word of God, tolerance is, a good, is, is your only real virtue. And all of a sudden, my, my land became, why would I do this? Why would I follow the word of God? I bought the lie, just like so many of the other speakers you heard. Abortion and contraception were good for women. I'm an OBGYN. I listened to Tony. His talk is spot on. Spot on. He wanted to be the best OBGYN he could be. And if we are a pro-choice specialty, well then by God, we're going to learn how to do first and second trimester terminations. Because when I go speak to medical students, I'm trying to use their language. Because I want them to at least listen to me. Because I come at it from an experiential point of view. I've done abortions. I held the forceps. I held the forceps. I twisted. I can tell you that I know from my hand, if any of you have been in the military and you've been in hand-to-hand -hand combat and you've taken a knife and you've buried it in someone's chest because they wanted to kill you, and you watch the life seep out from them as you twist. What's the abortion procedure about? Hand-to-hand -hand combat with an innocent third party. You're trying to help the woman. I'm sorry this is a life. I'm sorry, but goods, you know, I'm going to weigh the goods and bads here in a situational way. And yes, you, you really need to have this done. So it gets outweighed. And so we're going to do the procedure. But when you do it, it's experiential. That cannula that you use is only about eight or nine inches long. That's how close I am when I'm taking the life of that child. 
and it goes through the cannula, through my fingers, through my arm, into my heart. And my heart becomes a little bit more hardened every time. I know it because I've been there. I've done that. That's why this talk is called palpable mercy. The only answer to this problem is the divine mercy, is the mercy of God. So once again, this article in the Washington Post magazine, 24-year-old, first-year medical student, grow up, grew up in a very liberal, pro-choice family. I want my actions to be consistent with my words. She's talking about conscience, ladies and gentlemen, something that's under attack in this country right now. OBGYNs, number 385, bulletin 385, yeah, you can have conscience, but it's kind of like a feeling. I know you're going to have a hard time sleeping at night, Abby. Little did they know that there are terrors there. Oh, but it's okay. That's just get over it. Leave your ethics, leave your faith at the door, and come in, and because of patient autonomy, be a vending machine. She wants the abortion, you provide it. No matter, because don't get involved. Don't, because remember, there was another uh, op-ed piece in the Washington Post right after the finding of Gosnell's clinic that abortuary in Philadelphia with all the jars of the fetuses last year. Frances Kissling, the former, uh, I guess, president of Catholics for Choice, she wrote this incisive op-ed. She says, there is a human life present. We can no longer pretend the fetus is invisible because of all the ultrasounds that are being done. She says, we just have to decide, is a six-week-old fetus the same as a 22-week-old fetus? Are those abortions different? In Europe, they're different. In this country, it's abortion on demand, and that's what I did. For any reason, at any time, because, they wa because the patient wanted it. She says, forget the life argument. We've lost it. Let's go to access. We've got to talk about access. That's why all these studies are coming out. That's why this article about a hard choice was in the Washington Post magazine section. So she's going through and she's making these incredible, insightful comments. There isn't anything nice about abortion, Leslie says, but she really doesn't equate it with murder. I think it's a necessary evil. No, an unpleasant service that we have to provide for the sake of women's lives and health. A woman's control over her body is representative of her freedom. Remember, we have to move. It's what, it's what I think it was what Abby was saying just at lunch. My body, my choice, to my body, given up for you, do this in remembrance of me. Right? We've got to move from my body, my choice, to my body, given up for you. It's sacrificial. It's going the extra mile. It's about love. And if you love, you suffer. You raise money for projects that you don't have. But you do it because it's right. You step out in faith year after year. And you stand on that three-foot area outside the clinic, that chasm, as one of our friends said earlier. Three feet. Three feet. That's really all it is, but you have to see it with the eyes of Christ. Every abortion worker, every abortionist is within the sphere of God's mercy. I believe that. I've seen it because I am a product of that. All of you here who have prayed and fasted and spoke and acted on your pro-life convictions are a part of my rehabilitation, my renewal. He makes all things new. It's a promise. It's not a joke. All things. Romans 8.20, all things work to the good to those who love him, including our past. You can't write unplanned if you weren't in the industry. You can't stand here with families. God makes it healthy and holistic, integrated and holy. So she goes on and she says, um, it's a fascinating line here. She says, 
The lack of gentleness really bothered me. A few days later, she was in a papaya workshop practicing abortion. That's what you do, you use fruit to simulate the uterus. She concluded that something was missing. Uh, the discussion up to now might be difficult for doctors. To, why was it difficult for doctors to perform abortion? That's my question. So when I went to go talk to the medical schools, one question was, how pro-choice are we? Remember, you've got to use their language to get them to even have a conversation. Why? Because it's only respectful of where they're coming from. Different people come at it in different ways, but when you do things like this, all of a sudden, you get 70 people rather than the 10 expected at medical schools across the country, from Virginia to Southern California to the Mayo Clinic down to Dallas, Texas, University of Texas. 42 schools. I usually speak to audiences where 80% of the people are what they would consider themselves pro-choice, but kind of middle of the road, mushy middle. They're kind of lukewarm. 20, another, if that's 80%, then 15% would be considered pro-choice, rabidly pro-abortion. The last 5% are the people who are pro-life. But they're under siege. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Well, the doctor was probably just treating the abortion like any other medical procedure to take away the stigma, the emotional charge associated with it. See, she's talking about why are there so few abortionists? Some it's because they fear violence being done to them. Some of it is because they just don't want to deal with the hassle of crossing picket lines every day. Sometimes it's, and I think it's this, the real reason, is when you challenge someone to do the procedure and they're young, they come back to you and they say, you were right. Hitting a moving, living person and taking away that life is difficult to do. A young woman from George Washington University came to my talk two years in a row. The first year, she says, you know, I love your algorithm. Health is based on relationships. I want to form a relationship with these patients. Yes, I believe that medicine is an act of mercy. I believe you've got to hate the disease but love the patient. I don't agree with you that you always get rid of the disease. Sometimes you have to get rid of the patient with the disease, like in sick children. Remember, 90 2% of all OBGYNs abort babies who are sick. Abort babies that are sick. And they do it using the words compassion, mercy. This language that we're dealing with is a challenging issue because we don't even speak the same language anymore. And so this young lady goes on to say that... Um, She says, you know, this, 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 this dismembered fetus, I saw the arms and legs and body, but I didn't consider it a person yet. I don't think of the fetus as a person. And so what happens is, is that this article gives you an insight into where the students are. So once again, we went to try to engage them in conversation. The title of this year's talk was Keeping Abortion Safe, Legal, and Rare. How a former provider of abortions, who's now pro-life, has come to a clinical decision. Pack these houses everywhere we went. You've got to regulate these clinics. You've got to bring it up to a vote. And you've got to love enough to make abortion unwanted. The children have to be welcomed because we don't have the maternity homes talking to the pregnancy centers. And God forbid doctors work with pregnancy centers. There's no money, there's risk. We have to provide a, an example of that. So you change people's hearts, not just simply by language, but by presence. Be out there, pray for them. And so, we are trying to go after the young medical students. And so now they come to our office for externships every year to see how we integrate pregnancy centers with maternity homes, with social services. How do we bridge the gap? How do we pray with patients? 
How do you bridge the gap between the different creeds and the different forms of natural family planning? And now they're coming more and more because they're so disgusted with the medical profession. They went in it for one reason and they find that they're being limited. And so, in, in, once again, in my lifetime, um, there have been many people who've been influential in bringing me to where I am today. For instance, when I was a medical student, an abortion provider said, hey Johnny, you have a great knack of taking care of PMS. You would make a great gynecologist. You know, you can make some extra money if you provided abortion services. That sounded reasonable to me. You could provide a full range of services if you really learned the trade. It made sense to me. When I was in my residency, the first two years, we were a contraceptive research and development center. We were at the Jones Institute for Reproductive Medicine at Eastern Virginia School of Medicine, the home of the first test tube baby in this country. We had lots of clinical experience building contraceptives, providing abortion services, and building embryos. And yet this guy who was teaching me these procedures, it was a relationship we formed. He stayed up at, light, he stayed up at night with me. He says, I'll walk you through this. He answered my questions. He had a meal with me. But once again, you've got to realize, folks, that abortion is still not really spoken about in schools, in medical schools. It's almost like hushed on the outside. It's, the, the issue is so grave right now, and I think we have a moment in time where we can really make a difference. There's a doctor in California. Her name is Uta Landy. She's a former director of the National Abortion Federation. She has begun to create training programs for abortionists because it's harder and harder to find men and women willing to go into the specialty. It's a, it's a, we are, it's not, it's not all lost. There still is hope for intercessory prayer and fasting and relationships, bringing up this conversation of conversion, I call it. So out in California, the University of California at San Francisco, they've created two programs. First is the Family Planning Fellowship, which is two years post-residency program designed to further equip doctors to provide abortion and contraceptive services. So that's two years after their four-year residency. It's now offered at 21 university campuses. The second is the Kenneth J. Ryan Residency Training Program. They're supplying medical schools with the funds to train residents in OBGYN in providing abortions. They know they've got a problem. Healthcare, we're going to expand healthcare. We don't have enough family practitioners. They want to expand abortion services. They don't have enough OBGYNs. So now they're actively trying to do this. And so when I go talk, I'm usually talking to the students for choice. They come up afterwards and we engage in conversation. Why? Because I want to understand where they're coming from. This is a matter of building a relationship with them. Because that's the way that you can get inside why they do what they do. Father, Father Frank gives great advice to sidewalk counselors. You ask questions. You let the other person talk. You let them speak to you. You don't, jump, you don't immediately jump in to save them. You don't immediately jump in to push your point. It's genius. It's what Christ did. It's discipling. It's listening. It's trying to be present to the other. Young girls come into our office all the time because we've opened ourselves to these pregnancy centers. We do ultrasounds, and sometimes we're the last one to see that child alive. And yet we always tell them, you are welcome to come back to our office after the abortion. We can't go there. I can't do that for you. It's a bad choice in many, many ways. Physical, spiritual, emotional, relational but you can come back here, we won't judge you. Do you know most women who have abortions don't go back to their OBGYN, don't go back to the abortion clinic for their follow-up care? It's the most common surgical procedure in this country, and there's no follow-up. As someone said earlier, oh, just go to the ER. It's considered a miscarriage. Healthcare? Good? 
integrated? No. We can do better than that. And they come back to us. And slowly we begin to talk to them about dignity and about services and about changing one's heart. You're worth better. You're worth more than this. This guy's just using you. They come. Why? Because they're cared. They're loved. So, here I was doing an abortion. I didn't take a good history. The, water's, the lady's water broke. I quickly said, you know, we're just going to deliver your baby. The baby's not going to make it. So I delivered this child. I picked it up by the head after I delivered it. I put it on the scale, as which we do, and the baby was over 500 grams. There's 450 grams in a pound, so this baby was a pound and two ounces. They had to hit the button to bring the neonatology team in to help revive the baby. In walks Dr. Plum, looks at me square in the eyes and says, stop giving me tumors. You're better than this. Aborted a baby. The baby was too big, too old. It was breathing. It got revived and resuscitated. She engaged me and said, hey, listen, man. <laughs> You're better than this. And I knew I was. Because I went with a friend of mine to Mexico City to visit, a sh to actually help someone with some work but we went and visited the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I thought I heard there, and I did hear there, a very straightforward voice that said, why are you hurting me? I pushed it out of my mind, like so many of us. And a few years later, right after that incident, stop giving me tumors, my mother took me on another pilgrimage, because by this point I was not really anything. I was flirting with an evangelical church in Norfolk, Virginia, trying to come to my senses in the slop. And at another Marian site, my whole life came tumbling down. Mother of God, Jesus, the whole nine yards. And yet I look at these folks who don't have these experiences, and I envy them, because I was stupid enough and prideful enough and recalcitrant enough where I needed a firm shaking twice, not just once. It's very humbling to be up here. And so I need your prayers. We need your prayers in the medical community. Because if the medical community had the guts enough to stand up and say, this is wrong, this thing would stop. But it's an uphill fight. And so at one point in my life, everything converged. Data, medical studies that I was, re what I was reading saying, wait a second, they're not telling me the truth here. Abortion, breast cancer, abortion, prematurity. What? And then, people talking to me, the conversation of conversion. Dr. Debbie saying, stop giving me tumors. Relations, data, and spirituality, and a relationship with God, all came together at once in God's mercy. And I had a change of heart. So we open up a center, we finish my residency, we open up a center in Northern Virginia, eventually. It used to be for-profit, but with increasing malpractice premiums, decreasing reimbursements, we still had to see the pregnancy centers. We opened our doors to the pregnancy centers. We just didn't turn them away. That's giving back to the community. That's learning about real crisis. These women taught me about stress. We can now measure cortisol and DHEA in our practice through saliva to look at people's stress response. All of us who are depressed, foggy thinking, hair falling out, weight gain, loss of libido, nails not growing, GI problems, dry skin. You can now see how living in this world provides stress to the human body, how we are truly integrated, body, soul, and spirit. And you can show folks that you can trace the stress from the choices they're making in their lives. And so early in my career, I had to go do a, a, on a fetal demise on a baby that's passed away. I had to go to the abortion clinic, the second trimester abortion clinic, to use their instruments. The abortionist looked at me and said, what the heck are you doing here? I said, oh, I gotta use your instruments because this lady can't tolerate an induction, and the baby's dead, and I just need the equipment. He says, you know, man, 
He goes, I am so, you and I don't agree on anything, but I do respect you. You never dump on me. There are many other Christian doctors out there who can't do the procedure themselves, but when push comes to shove, they send them to me. This doctor and I have, over time, have become acquaintances. Once again, you've got to learn to live this action. You've got to be able to just be a model. You don't have to say a whole lot. You just have to live it. Your presence outside these centers is crucial. During one of my uh, cases with cancer, my own, cancer, my own case with cancer, I was in getting chemotherapy uh, once, a month, once a week for four months in a row. And I was worried because, of course, I was prideful and, you know, people are coming to the pro-life doctor and the only people that would cover me were the abortionists. So in my community, the people who helped me out, because I helped them out when they were having problems, side effects of their own terminations, I stepped in to help them with their, 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 their moms, they then began to help me out. And yes, we run a perinatal hospice in our program, so we don't, we use the womb as a hospice for babies with disabilities that will not survive. Our quality of life is not an issue with, with us as we approach, because we believe that we can hospice these patients and give you the maximum time spent with your sick child. Well, guess what? One of those weeks that I'm stuck in the hospital getting chemo, puking my brains out, gaining weight, being bloated, worried about, oh my God, Dr. Bruchowski's not there, one of the abortionists delivers an anencephalic baby of mine at 34 weeks. Comes in late at night and says, John, you take care of monsters. How dare you not tell me that this woman was going to, you do what? You know, I've got to rethink about helping you because that was disgusting. You should have aborted that monster early on. And then he left. Well, many years later, after realizing that God doesn't really need me, the same doctor comes into my office and says, hey, Johnny, I just came by to give you a picture. I was just overseas, and I knew your favorite city was Dubrovnik, Yugoslavia. I brought you a picture. And as he walked out, he turned around, and he says, and oh, by the way, um, I just want to let you know I stopped doing abortions. I said, what? He goes, yeah, remember that comment I told you about the monster? I saw more love in that room than in any of my wanted babies that I've delivered in my practice over 30 years. I saw more love in that mom's eyes. I saw more love in that family because they were greeting their sick sibling, their sick child, and I realized that I was on the wrong side of that issue, and I took it out on you. I'm sorry. But don't tell anybody. Thanks. Patted me on the shoulder and left. Conversions happen not on our timing. We just have to be instruments of God's love and mercy. And I'm going to finish up here um, with a, a story of a young man who's in another state, who's act actively discipling another abortionist. Hey, Dr. So-and-so, could you please, can I please talk to you? He approached him by himself, not with a group, not with a full line of people, but by himself. I want to understand where you're coming from. I want to understand you. Can we have lunch? Started a process over 10 years now that he's actively discipling this gentleman. Please. No one is out of the reach of God's mercy because it's palpable and it's real. And so what I just want to end with here is that I want you to please keep Divine Mercy Care and the Tepeyac Family Center in your prayers. If you know of healthcare professionals that are struggling, questioning, please go online and look at our website. Send them to us. We're this is part of our mission. It's becoming a big portion of my mission. Just this conversation of conversion. And so uh, what we need now most is the witness of saints like you all here in the audience. Holiness is the sign of the church's credibility, and it is especially needed by both patients and providers, us. 
to renew the face of the earth, the Holy Spirit can transform our hearts and we can be recreated to love enough so abortion becomes unwantable. From the bottom of my heart, I can't thank Ann and Joe enough for what they sacrificed for me and uh, what they've done here at the Pro-Life Action League. Their information, but their presence and their perseverance. Because I am a new creation today through the grace and the mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but it's because he works through instruments as feeble and young as Joe Scheidler uh, and uh, the rest of us. So thank you very much. Um, I think it's ultimately a, a, a short-term problem. Um, I believe that the experience of doing the procedure in and of itself is often a deterrent to the person doing it. This young woman who I challenged, I said, if you don't believe me about love, hate the disease, love the patient, do the abortion next year and see if it's a loving choice. Now, here I am challenging her to do the procedure, because once again, ma'am, we're, we're so far, they know it's a human life. They're gonna do the procedure anyway. My, my word of compassion, her word of compassion, my word of mercy, her word, we don't even communicate. So I'm now trying to go to an experiential she comes back the next year and says, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it, John. I think I'm maybe pro-life with some exceptions rather than pro-choice with some exceptions. So what we have to help is to keep educating and getting into schools to provide an alternative, an optional. A young student from UVA said, you're the first doctor that told me that life begins at fertilization or conception. First. That principle is a done deal in medicine. And yet, by persistence and perseverance, those done deals can be overturned. So for me, it's pure education. It's one-on-one -on -one speaking with the students, because once again, that's where they're going. There's articles now about how low-level providers can perform suction abortions in Vietnam, and they're trying to pass them in Arizona, in California. It's a struggle, but I think we need to continue to testify, and sadly, I think it's a matter of experience. It's a matter of having relationships with these people and planting seeds in their head about the difficulty of ending a human life up close. That's, that's not a great answer, but that's been my experience. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you for listening to this talk from the Pro-Life Action League's conference, Converted from Abortion Provider to Pro-Life Activist, held on September 22, 2012 in Chicago, Illinois. For more talks from this conference or more information on the work of the Pro-Life Action League, visit ProLifeAction.org.